What you're about to hear about are four diary or journal entries left behind with disturbing backstories. It was a typical Wednesday night at home for nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton and her family when there was a knock at the door. And it was six-year-old Emma Bustamante who lived across the woods looking for Elizabeth to come play. It was October 21st, 2009, and the sun would set at 6.30 p.m. Elizabeth's mother knew she'd be back on time for dinner because she was deathly afraid of the dark, and the woods that separate their homes turn into a scary place for little kids at night. But at 6 o'clock, Elizabeth hadn't made it home. Immediately, Elizabeth's mom calls her neighbors home. They tell her Elizabeth is not there. Elizabeth had her cell phone with her, yet she hadn't been answering any of her mom's nonstop calls, which was a huge red flag. It was later found out that when Elizabeth left Emma and started her journey out of the woods home, she was allegedly diverted by Emma's half-sister Alyssa, who called Elizabeth on her cell phone and redirected her back to Alyssa's house. Alyssa then led Elizabeth into the woods, and since Elizabeth was afraid of the dark and knew who Alyssa was, she likely trusted the 15-year-old. But Elizabeth couldn't have anticipated what was going to happen. Alyssa brutally killed the little girl, slashing her on the neck and arms, then being fatally stabbed. Police would investigate Alyssa's room and made many crude findings. The walls were covered with bizarre writings, some in pen while others, it appeared, were in blood. In one corner of the room, there was a poem about cutting, and in another corner of the room were crude sketches of people harming themselves. But the most disturbing finding in the room was Alyssa's diary, specifically her most recent diary entry. It had been scribbled over with blue pen, but investigators would later use a blue light to finally reveal her last entry on the day Elizabeth disappeared. And it read, I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my god, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky right now though. Okay, I gotta go to church now, lol. This diary entry was as damning as it could get. Alyssa eventually admitted to the murder during her interrogation. It had all come out now. How did she kill her? How did she die? Nine year old girls don't just die. We were messing her out. And she fell back and hit her head. Was her throat cut? Yeah. Oh. The diary entry truly painted the terrifying picture of a ruthless, young murderer that she was. She had been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Elizabeth's body was found in a shallow grave, one of two that Alyssa admitted to digging a week before the murder, giving rise to the speculation that her twin brothers were the original intended victims. The diary entry was presented as evidence that she should get life in prison regardless of her young age. Believe it or not, there was a possibility that she could only get 10 years in prison, but the diary entry was the icing on the cake that solidified her fate. Both Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris had rather chilling diary entries. Dylan and Eric killed 13 students and one teacher, along with injuring another 20. The two's diary entries provided the world with a glimpse into their minds before committing a mass murder. Starting with Dylan, he clearly was suffering from low self-esteem and depression. He really seemed to desperately want friends and to be accepted, but his peers refused to accept him. Dylan was big into writing, actually, and he had many diary or journal entries. One of his final entries, though, was a brief outline of his plan on the day of the shooting, even revealing what he planned to wear during it. Walk in, set bombs at 11.09, for 11.17, leave, set car bombs, drive to Clemente Park, gear up, get back by 11.15, Park cars, set bombs for 1118, get out, go to outside hill, wait. This was clearly an outline for the schedule he had for the day of the attack. Eric Harris's motivations were not much different at all from Dylan's. There were rants on old online forums from Eric from as far back as 1996. He would go off online about everything he felt was unfair in this world, about how he had never been accepted and how he just wanted to fit in. He would sprinkle in some dark song lyrics into his rants occasionally. Eric had drawings of the school and plans for their massacre in his diary, and drawings of guns were found all over his diary. The final entry, though, is rather upsetting and truly shows where Eric's motivation came from. 
I hate you people for leaving me out of so many things. And no, don't effing say, well, that's your fault, because it isn't. You people had my phone number, and I asked and all, but no. No, 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 don't let the weird-looking Eric kid come along. Eric also removed any possible blame on his family, music, or video games for his actions, and he took sole responsibility for what he was soon going to do. The diaries of both Dylan and Eric show how they felt unwanted and displaced in the world. They also show the negative effects that loneliness, social rejection, and untreated mental illness can lead to. What you're about to hear may sound like a diary entry written by Charles Manson or some other serial killer. It actually appeared in a diary kept by a young girl named Pearl Moen. I stabbed an innocent woman to death earlier today, technically yesterday since it's 1am. It was absolutely fantastic. Murder gives me a high unlike any other. It feels like this crisp unreality flashing and sparkling, adrenaline and shock, fight or flight mode. How do I even go about describing it? The whole thing was unreal. I'm so proud of myself. I stabbed her like 20 times, maybe more, I wasn't counting. She screamed and grabbed at me, saying what the fuck, help, leave. For now, I should explain why. Other than the fact that I'm a homicidal psychopath, I have a deep hatred towards people right now. Yesterday I lost my other gold ring I've worn all my life on a chain around my neck as it was ripped off by a girl I was murdering. Fate is weird. She was mistaken about one thing though, the woman she stabbed did not die. Pearl Moen was 17 years old when she attacked a random nurse and stabbed her 21 times, a complete stranger to her, mind you. Pearl had been hiding behind the bushes in a park where the victim and her date were wrapping up their evening. When the woman's date left to use the bathroom, Pearl attacked, eventually leaving the woman she thought was dead. She then took to her diary to write about how thrilling and fun the experience was for her. While her victim survived the horrific attack, Pearl remained on the run for three months before law enforcement finally caught up with her after a neighborhood association handed out flyers with a sketch of Pearl, and eventually Pearl's own mother would call the police and report that she believed her daughter matched the description of the suspect seen in the flyers. When her bedroom was searched and officers found her diary, there was no question that it was she who committed the brutal and vicious attack. Pearl's victim told her in court that she was glad she stabbed her rather than a child, an elderly person, or someone who could not defend themselves. The victim said she was able to save herself because of her medical training. The teenager described herself as a homicidal maniac in her diary, and she definitely proved that to be true. Pearl took a plea deal and is currently serving a 15-year sentence for attempted murder. In 2018, an unnamed woman shared disturbing excerpts from a diary she claimed was kept by her obsessive male colleague for a whole year. In the journal, her co-worker apparently noted everything she had worn to work and told her how they'd spend their lives together. One of the entries even ends with the message, I'm coming for you, my love, coming for us. The woman, who wished to remain anonymous, revealed she worked alongside the man for three years, but for the longest time, she never had any idea her co-worker was interested in her. It wasn't until the woman left the firm to start a new job that she claims he was arrested for camping outside her apartment for three days. Her address was given to him by a worker in the HR department, resulting in him camping outside of her apartment for days. That employee was fired after word got out. After getting the woman's address, the obsessed co-worker left work at lunchtime, bought a bunch of things he thought would win the woman over, and came to her apartment, where he camped outside for days until a resident reported him and police made him leave the premises. The woman wasn't there, she was flying to another city to rent an apartment for her new job. The man had also sent her his diary entries, which are pretty disturbing. They read as follows. February 23rd, 2016. Wearing brown wrap dress with silver buckle on belt. Three inch heels also brown, hair up, little too much mascara. You and Blank were talking about that dumb show, Pretty Little Liars. I tried to get into it, for you. But after two seasons, I just couldn't take it anymore. Holy moly, it is some vapid crap. When we are together, I will introduce you to amazing TV and movies. I know you won't mind staying home to raise our children properly. It is what women are built for, after all. Certainly you need to work now, but no fear, my love. I will take care of you the second you are ready. I will lavish you with all you need to support, love, and cherish me and our children. March 29th, 2016. Wearing Unknown. I hope you're enjoying your vacation, but I miss you terribly. This week will be pure hell, and I'm counting down the minutes until next Monday. Honestly, I thought of going with you. I'm sure if you saw me there in the resort, your heart would have been bursting with love, but maybe not. 
I'm sorry for doubting you, but on that tiny chance that you weren't super happy to have me there, parentheses, I can't be part of your friend's wedding, right? I couldn't put you through that. Sometimes it seems like you're close to acknowledging our true love. Other times, it frustrates me. I'm sorry, but it does. I don't want to be mad, so I wait. But not forever, silly. Heck, this could be for the best. Seeing holy matrimony could be the push you need. I hope so, because I love you, and you love me, soon. November 23rd, 2016, wearing who the hell knows. How can you do this? How? How can you abandon our one true love? How can you abandon our life together? How can you doom our future generations to nothingness? How? I am bereft without you, adrift at sea. I can't be without you. I won't be without you. I will follow you to the ends of the universe. Know that. I will find you and I will help you understand, for us, to complete the truly most important relationship ever. I see I need to take control. I wanted to wait for you, but I see that like other women, you need your man to take charge. No more waiting. I will show you what you have been too blind to see with your own eyes. What has been sitting patiently, listening, watching, documenting you for posterity. After she shared these chilling diary entries with Imager and Reddit, the woman said she was able to finally move on with her life after moving to another city and undergoing counseling. In her Reddit post, she wrote, I received these journals and pen, flowers, candy, and a huge stuffed bear from my former cubicle neighbor at a job I worked at for three years. As you'll see, the guy is freaking nuts. Our cubicles were next to each other the whole time I worked at this firm. We were kind of friendly the first six months I was there. Then he asked me on a date. I very politely declined, very firm that I don't date co-workers and whatnot. After that, besides for a friendly hello, he said almost nothing to me. We were on different teams, so it wasn't a big deal to me, but after I turned him down, he started keeping this journal. Referring to the first entry, she added, This entry also takes a turn into the crazy end. Up until now, he called me pet names and talked as if we were currently dating. This is the first time that he really reveals that he's planned the rest of our lives out for us. The last nine months of the journals get really bad, which are the entries you just heard. According to the woman, the man is currently in jail serving a two to five year sentence for an attempted kidnapping, 